a lot of what Fran talked about and a lot of what we talked about uh, earlier today in, in developing an NCP, what the indicators are for developing your NCP uh, and, and the uh, indicators that you're going to use in reporting uh, are built on surveillance. So in a, in a lot of ways, the end, ending cholera begins and, and has a middle and an end with the kind of surveillance that you have. And, and it's very important for the GTFCC to be able to help countries uh, improve their surveillance. So um, when we talk about surveillance and, and the, the objectives of, of surveillance, we have, as in the uh, uh, end collar roadmap, uh, the two axes. And the first axis, uh, really, surveillance is dedicated to early detection and response. And it, 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 uh, what I put here was just a cycle of how that goes from being able to recognize the clinical syndrome of of cholera so that you then are, uh, then you have the impulse to uh, screen that person with a rapid diagnostic test that is available in your health facility. Uh, and if you have the right uh, uh, situation that you raise a cholera alert uh, and you're able to then confirm that cholera is indeed present uh, using culture or in some cases PCR. Uh, and that it, when there's an outbreak, you have a regular uh, check for transmission using uh, culture or PCR to confirm or, or uh, decide that the transmission has come to an end at the end of an outbreak. And then we use uh, EPI and lab-directed targeted interventions when we are doing an outbreak uh, response, and uh, it helps guide that with targeted interventions. The second part uh that the role that surveillance plays is in access to and it's what really fran was talking about it's it's having data historic data ideally weekly uh at the at the district level and that's not always possible to develop a map of your cholera burden uh and the the high disease burden areas that represent hot spots uh, and then you use that mapping then to target your ocv and wash uh, uh, interventions as well as improving cholera surveillance because the next part is equally important and that's being able to monitor and evaluate the impact of the interventions that you're having and being able to shift and change uh, how you direct your response or your interventions over time depending on uh, how, uh, uh, what kind of impact is observed uh, in the areas you're intervening. So we, we did a survey, uh, uh, Chesco, uh, help uh, put together a survey, and it was passed uh, to several countries over the last year in the working group uh, in April 2018 primarily. And, and you see the list of gaps and, and uh, needs of countries, and they're not a surprise to anyone, and I think some countries will have more or less of some of these gaps, but these are all the, the gaps that we wanted to try to address as, as much as we could as GTFCC. So what I wanted to get to in this presentation are two things. One is, is what is it that the GTFCC, its partners, uh, can, can uh, assist uh, ministries of health and governments uh, to improve their surveillance, to be able to detect outbreaks, to be able to uh, uh, describe their uh, cholera burden in hotspots and be able to monitor and evaluate their uh, interventions. So. Uh, the offer of services I'm going to list here are come into categories. One is guidance documents, and we've got uh, the surveillance document that has clinical case definitions. Uh, we worked on on how on providing job aids for RDT sampling and interpretation. We have a line list template that's been developed, uh, and and the job aids that uh, are on the table. Some of them that are on the table in the back uh, on how to do cholera culture collection and packaging of samples. Uh, and one of the things that we have not achieved yet, but it was discussed by Fran earlier, is a list of standard operating procedures and objectives for rapid response teams or really outbreak uh, response teams uh, so that uh, we have a, 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 an EPI-led standardized way of approaching uh, uh, cholera alerts and, and uh, immediate response. And then. Uh, a last part is the environmental surveillance methods uh, for which we have a document uh, uh, ready for distribution in the next few weeks. 
beyond just papers and words on paper and guidance are the materials that are important to, to improving surveillance and, and the, the list of uh, materials here uh, are, are pretty self-evident. The, the availability and distribution and, and regular supply of RDTs has been difficult. Uh, having all the samples and, and the how-to and the transport to, to get uh, stool samples to, to the nearest laboratory, which may be very far away or in the capital city, uh, is, uh, is a need. Uh, as are the basic hardware and, and lab outfitting for uh, being able to do culture and drug sensitivity testing. Uh, the standard supply kit for outbreak response and then uh, the, the supplies that are used to monitor FRC and fecal coliforms when doing environmental water surveillance testing. And then we also want to be able to improve what's already in service. Uh, many countries or most countries already have a health information system or some kind of reporting system for cholera. Uh, and to echo Dominique, this needs to be a system that is multi-disease, that focuses across the array of uh, public health uh, Disease, uh, diseases and, and, and shouldn't be a standalone, standalone system. Uh, we also want to be able to uh, help countries uh, uh, develop an external internal lab quality assurance program. We have uh, uh, supranational reference labs who are interested in engaging with countries to improve their quality assurance programs. And then uh, the, as we've talked about, we'll talk about Tomorrow is the development and coordination of, of research uh, activities and cholera field research in the different uh, categories you see there. So um, some of this discussion is going to, to be about cost and uh, how, uh, how much it, it might uh, uh, cost to get uh, surveillance uh, systems going in, in the countries that we're supporting. We, we've had an investment case, and uh, just the, these are some top line numbers from that, uh, or maybe it's bottom line numbers, that uh, the, considering the 415 million people at risk at this baseline year of 2018, and including a number of costs, including capital costs, the operations and maintenance of, of uh, machinery and facilities, and all the consumables that go into, into diagnostics, uh, and then factoring in depreciation and amortization and staff salaries and percentages of those staffs, the salaries that might go to cholera versus other diseases in the public health disease program. It's a very complex uh, um, methodology for estimating costs, and I recognize the difficulty of doing so. Uh, and I think they did a, a, a great job. Uh, and they came up with a cost per person per year of 13 cents. Uh, initially, and that as as time goes on, that that goes up and down a little bit. But uh, just using the 13 cents per year, we wanted to uh, look at the cost a little bit differently uh, to see uh, what the cost might be initially up front, uh, faced with the realities that we are that we have today in implementing uh, collar control services. So, uh, just doing. What amounts to a back of an envelope uh, calculation? We took, uh, uh, we made a, a several assumptions. One being that this initial time horizon for investment was three years, uh, and that we would be focusing only on countries who are currently engaged uh, uh, with the GTFCC in, in developing and, and implementing their cholera roadmap, uh, or were likely to be in the near future, and then uh, limiting it to countries that have had cholera reported in the last three years, uh, and uh, focused on hotspot populations per country, and in countries that were in a, a humanitarian crisis situation like Yemen or, or even Somalia, uh, limiting the number of people in hotspots that could be realistically addressed with an implementation of cholera control plans and surveillance uh, to two million people. The total hotspot population when going uh, through that exercise came out to uh, 52 million people. So uh, just as in the um, investment case, uh, we used the hotspot population of, okay, two, 200,000 uh, per hotspot. Uh, and use some of the cost estimates for the different items uh, uh, in the uh, cost estimation of RDTs and cultures and the training support and capital costs. And then 
use the Gavi approach to, to support the countries which uses the World Bank's ranking of countries uh, on their gross national income uh, to come up with categories of levels of support in terms of proportion of, of the total cost uh, for the countries that were included. And this uh, annual cost came to uh, $4.7 million uh, per year in, in, in the first three years. So I think that's the end of the, the talk, and happy to take any questions. <laughs>